The Gospel according to Matthew, of course, the emphasis all the way through is Christ is the King, the King of Kings. Now, Jesus has not yet referred to Himself as the King. In fact, His favorite reference to Himself that He would use most often in the Gospel records is the Son of Man. And one Gospel, four Gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Matthew's, though, He's the King of Kings. And Matthew's presenting Him to the Jew as, Here is your Messiah, the King. But in this chapter is the first and last, first and only time that Jesus will refer to Himself as King. In this passage, I should say, Matthew chapter 25, he does it a couple times, uh, beginning uh, in verse 34, and then again, uh, in, and it's capital K King, verse 40, uh, like that. And so it's interesting, but the, the here, now he's talking about the king's return when he comes not as the lowly Messiah, but the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Matthew here has bracketed the Lord's public ministry between the Sermon on the Mount, where he began, Matthew chapter 5, and then the Olivet Discourse right here. If you look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, He said to His disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover. So you're right here at the Passover. So He's last words, we've talked about this. And, um, and so the emphasis of the Sermon on the Mount, very practical. Emphasis of the Olivet Discourse here is very prophetic. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, in one sermon, we read the rules, Sermon on the Mount, the rules of the kingdom. In the other, we hear about the return of the king. And uh, before giving the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord was baptized. After giving the Olivet Discord, he's buried for you and I. Prior to the first sermon, he proved that the tempter could not conquer him in Matthew chapter 4. After his last sermon, he proved that the tomb could not conquer him. So hold your place in Matthew here. We're coming right back. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10. We're going to turn a little bit, so get your fingers, uh, you know, if you're in the popping knuckles, get them popped, whatever you need to do. Uh, stretch them out, whatever. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're, you want to know what the Bible says, I'm sure, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. One of the things you have to understand about the New Testament is God says there's three audiences now, when you're studying something, you want to know who is the one doing the speaking and who's the one being spoken to. Um, we're going to see in this passage, for instance, uh, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. Well, you and I, we wouldn't worry about if it was on the Sabbath. So he's not talking to you and I. It doesn't mean there's not something we could pull from the passage, but he's speaking to Jews. And he's saying, he's talking about Judea, it's the ones that live there. I'm not going to go to the mountains in Judea. <laughs> Of course, I won't be here. I believe the pre-tribulation, pre-millennial rapture, that's what our church believes. And what, we, what I believe, I believe that's what the Bible teaches. But, but it, when he says that, it's not saying we've got to get on a flight and go. No, no, he's saying that Jerusalem is where the actions happen at this point. He's talking to the Jews, okay? And so things like that, you have to know who he's talking to. Well, how do we know that there's three groups like that? Well, look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. The Bible says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, group number one, nor to the Gentiles, group number two, nor to the church of God, group number three. And so the Bible divides into those three groups, and we'll look at that a little more in the message, but in this age, in the church age, this parenthesis, when the Jews rejected him, now he turns to the Gentiles, it's called the age of the Gentiles, so the Gentiles, uh, the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Uh, the, in this parenthesis here, uh, that we call the church age, uh, he, he is working to call people out to his name from both the Jews and the Gentiles. And we make up the church of God. And so we compose this third group. And the third group will be taken out at the rapture. We're not here for much of Matthew 24. I'll point that out in just a second. And so then you only have two groups left, the Jews and the Gentiles. Church is gone. The bride's gone. For instance, in the parable this morning uh, about the bridesmaids. Okay, We're not the bridesmaids. That's Israel. We're the bride. Okay? We're already gone. Uh, no bridegroom goes anywhere without the bride. Okay? Uh, he, and in their day, and you have to understand the culture, in their day the bridegroom leaves his home, goes to the bride's house, and gets the bride. And at her, that, that, then all of them come with him back to the wedding feast, and people gather along the way to join. These bridesmaids were going to join when they got there. The call came that he's coming, and then they enter into the feast. Okay? And so, uh, anyway, just to help a little bit with some of, of that type of uh, the pictures that are here. 
Matthew chapter 24, we're just going to read three verses to start, and then we're going to walk through the, the, the passage. Uh, Matthew 24, 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3. I want you to see this key. This is the three points of the message, these questions here. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Number one, tell us when these things, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And so we're going to look at it in order as we go through the passage and ask the Lord to help us with this title, The Prophetic Truths of the Return of the King. We looked at the practical this morning, now the prophetic truths about the return of the King. Let's pray. Lord, help us now as we look at your word. Lord, may we glean the nuggets of truth here. May we learn of what we're, we're seeing in our world and how we don't have to be troubled. You've told us these things are going to come and how we can trust in you. Though we don't know everything, we know you know it all, and we're holding your hand, and we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're praying tonight, Lord, open our eyes to behold wondrous things of thy law. We have to understand when he, Jesus is talking about what of these three questions. So I'm going to give that to you. Let's answer them. I believe personally, verses 5 through 8 is the only part, really, to the church. Now, I think one of the parables, the one of the three servants, is also to the church age. He says there's going to be a reckoning day, and that's where we find well done, now good and faithful servant, which all of us are desiring to hear. And, and so, but those are the parables. This, chapter 24, gives all the teaching, if you will, the prophetic teaching. And then in Matthew 25, you have prophetic parables. A parable of the, of the bridesmaids, uh, the, the virgins, parable of the... Um, servants there that get the talents, and then parable of the sheep and the goats, all right? And uh, there, that's Israel, the church, and the Gentile nations. All right, number, uh, uh, first thing I want to point out, those verses 5 through 8, so let's read it. Uh, verse 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceive you. Verses 5 through 8, Jesus, I believe, is bridging the gap of the church age, and that's what we're seeing today. So we're already seeing these things, verses 5 through 8, and we can see the beginning of what's happening. Look at it. For many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. I mentioned this morning that pestilences is COVID-19 is one of those. And it's plural. There will be others. And there's been ones before. Verse 8. All these things, excuse me, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And again, you study what that's talking about. It's talking about beginning of labor pains, if you will. Uh, the, the, the Lord Jesus is about to appear. The child's about to come. The beginning of labor is happening, but it's not the end yet. And, and I believe that right there is speaking of today, what we're seeing. All right? We can see the beginning. Which brings us to this key word. Notice, what's the first word of verse 9? Would you say it? What is it? Then, all the way through the passage, you're going to see that word. It's a key word. It's a time mover. It's helping us see what's coming next. Notice it's a key time word. Now verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now who is hated of all nations? Who in this world have continued been hated of all nations? The Jews. Yeah, Israel, you're exactly right. So it shifts now here, and he's going to speak to the Jews for a period of time, and uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But verse 9 begins to address the nation of Israel. So let's answer Jesus. the questions asked Jesus. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. The first question, verse 3, when shall these things be? All right, when shall these things be? That's point number one. We'll just look at the three questions or three points. Turn with me to Luke 21, would you? He answers this in Luke 21. And you're going to see the similarities. Luke 21, of course, is he's, the, the, the gospel according to Luke here is being written. It's the same uh, event here, the Olivet Discourse. And uh, notice in Luke 21, beginning verse 20. <clears throat> so he just said the destruction of the temple is going to happen. Every stone is going to be thrown down. When shall these things be? So it's first asking, when's this? And we know it was AD 70. It was in their lifetime. Here it is, verse 20 of Luke 21. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, 
Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountain, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be a great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Notice this phrase. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that event has already happened. In AD 70, the Jews were dispersed across the world. And by the way, there's more Jews still not in Israel than in Israel. And there was no Israel until 1948. And so uh, this time of the Gentiles, what we're living in, so that's already happened. That's the question answered, of, uh, the answer to the question there of the first part. Tell us when these things shall be. And so when is this destruction going to come to this temple? And that's when it happened there in Luke 21. Question number two. We're actually going to go to the third question here just for order in the text, all right? Uh, so the next question is, what shall be the sign of the end of the world? Now, when you say end of the world, that's the last part of verse 3, end of the end of the world. What's the sign of the end of the world? When you say end of the world, okay, uh, you can even think in your mind just the end of the age, okay? Because, and the reason I say this, because Jesus is going to come and set up a thousand-year reign millennial kingdom. Oh, there's no sign for the end of that. Okay, we don't need a sign. Jesus will be here, and we'll all be listening to him, and he'll be ruling and reigning this earth. And so when the thousand years is up, there'll be the battle of Gog and Magog, and then that's when the heaven and earth pass away. So the world doesn't end, okay, until after the thousand year reign. So when you say the end of the world, here we're talking about the end of an age, and the end of when, basically when Jesus is returning, okay, uh, and, uh, and then the end of that. Uh, part there with the Battle of Armageddon. So let's look at the text. Uh, I believe he's answering this beginning in verse 9, where we left off. Verse 9. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Uh, one thing to point out here. If Jesus was warning us about false prophets, we'd say to the church age, there's no more prophets. The time of prophets is over. Okay, uh, We don't have prophets. We have false teachers. You see warnings for false teachers. But to Israel, see, they would still think of the word prophet. And so, again, I believe I this, another point that's showing to the Jews, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved or delivered. Uh, meaning you come out of the tribulation into the millennial kingdom, and not saved, you get to go to heaven. We don't endure to the end to get to heaven. We trust Jesus Christ as Savior to get to heaven. I think we understand that, right? Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So, some people get this idea like, we got to usher in God's kingdom. We've got to get the gospel to everyone. That will cause Jesus to return. That's a misunderstanding of this verse. We in this day are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus began his ministry preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Let me show you. Go backwards in Matthew, Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This is the first message uh, of, of the Lord Jesus as well. Notice Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And saying... Here's John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was. Jesus was going to come and offer himself to them. Had they received Jesus, he came in his own, his own received him not. But had they received him, it wasn't a false offer. He would have come in and set up as their Messiah. But they said no. Okay, so John the Baptist is preaching that. Also Matthew 4, verse 17 and notice here, John the Baptist is uh, put in prison, verse 12. Now verse 17, Jesus steps forward and begins preaching. The forerunner's time is over, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we've studied through the book of Matthew, and we showed the first time Jesus sent out his disciples, he said, Go not to anyone but the house of Israel. That's it. The message was the house of Israel. What was the message? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Your Messiah is here. But remember, they rejected. 
And when they did, the Lord in Matthew 11 began to change his message and said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It became an individual plea rather than them to receive him as a nation. All right, but what's going to happen? Well, the church age will be over. We're raptured out at the beginning of tribulation. And now God's timepiece, Israel, steps back on the scene in the forefront of what God is doing. And God, uh, God is going to have 144,000. They're not Jehovah Witnesses. They're, they're Jews. They're going to be flaming, powerful evangelists. 12,000 from each tribe. You say, well, some of them don't even know what tribe they're in. The Lord knows what tribe they're in. And they're going to preach all over the world. And everyone's going to hear, hey, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it is. Seven years, the time is ticking. See? And it's, only at, it's partway through, I think it's at the three and a half year mark when these evangelists come out. It starts with the two witnesses. And many want to talk about who those may be. Moses, Elijah, Elijah, uh, Moses and, uh, Elijah and Enoch. But whoever it is, and then these, all these witnesses and evangelists. So that is the message of the kingdom. And it's preached again in the tribulation period. And you say, well, how do they receive this gospel? They put their faith in the Lord. Put their faith in the King that's coming. The one that died for you. People all the way through have gotten saved the same way. We study in the New Testament about Abraham and how it was counted for him to righteousness as he believed God. And everyone in the, in the Old Testament looked forward to the cross. When Abel offered that lamb in Genesis, the, that first time he was offering it. And if you had asked Abel, why are you offering the lamb? He would have said, because one day... That the seed of the woman is coming, the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. You'd ask uh, all the way through the Old Testament, that's what it was. John the Baptist, when, when he points out, says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And so they were looking forward to the cross, the Lamb slain. They didn't know how and all of that, but they were putting their faith in God and the redemption that would come through the seed of the woman, the miraculous virgin birth. All right, now we're looking at it from the past. It's happened already. So, what shall these things be? We've answered that. Number two, what shall be the sign of the end of the world, the end of the age? Let's keep reading now in verse 15, or 14. This gospel, the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then, notice that time word again, then shall the end come. So, it's happened. Everyone's heard the gospel. Everyone's heard the gospel of the kingdom in the tribulation time. Look at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then, notice that time word again, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So this is a message again to Israel. This marks the three and a half year point of the seven year tribulation period. So what, what marks that? The abomination of desolation. Spoken of Daniel. We're going to turn to Daniel. Uh, if you want to find in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 9. Da Daniel chapter 9. The prophet Daniel, obviously the Lord Jesus calls his name and refers to this prophecy. It's Daniel 9 and verse 26. You've got Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then you'll come here, all right, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks, now this is talking about a weeks of years, the You've maybe heard of the 70th week, all right? There's 69 weeks uh, that have already come to pass, but the 70th week, you might have heard of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, I can't cover everything tonight, so I'm going to mention things. You're like, what is that? We'll preach through Revelation at some point, and, and it'll take a series to go through everything. I'm mainly trying to focus on what's happening on the earth um, I, I, during this time in between. What's going on in heaven, there's a whole lot of more things, too. But, but we're trying to just stay to the text of Matthew 24 here, all right? But Daniel, he, Jesus refers to right here, notice, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall uh, come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And so I believe that any Jew paying attention, just like they knew when Jesus would come, they would know when he was going to be put to death if they would have followed the timeline. The Lord tells them. Remember, the Jews require a sign. The Lord always had signs for them. And so he's going to be cut off. That hap has already happened, hasn't it? The Messiah. Now verse 27. And he, uh, talking about this prince, the prince is the Antichrist, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is that treaty that will be signed with Israel of seven years of peace. One week, it's not about a week of years, so seven years. 
And in the midst of the week, that's three and a half years in, he's, he's, had, he's done with the Jews, he's got all he needs from them, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So that means it was happening. Well, for years, there is no Jewish temple. And many believe that the Jews still have the furniture for the temple. It's hidden away somewhere. I don't know if that's true or not. But when the tribulation begins, or right before that, in that time period, the oblation, the sacrifice, is going to start again. They're going to start offering the sacrifice there. You say, why? Because they're still deceived, honestly. But the temple is going to be rebuilt, and they're going to offer the sacrifice again. And for the overspreading, but in the midst of the week, this Antichrist shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And so, if you study in what happens, what the Revelation talks about with the beast, the Antichrist is going to make an image of himself, the beast, and put it in the most holy place. And in the holy place, in the temple, he'll make the sacrifice to cease to Jehovah God, and he's going to set himself up as God, as Christ, and his image to be worshipped. And that's what the devil has always wanted, the whole world and everyone to worship him. And so uh, that gives you an idea what he's referring to in verse 15. Go back to Matthew 24 now as we work through the text. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, we just looked at that, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. That's this beast, this image put up. Whoso readeth, let him understand. You say, I don't know what abomination of desolation. Hey, look, I don't know what it looks like either. I'm not looking for the abomination of desolation. I'm looking for what Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And any moment, the trump sound will be gone. But about three and a half years after that, the people on this earth, they'll be studying the Bible, the ones that get saved, uh, ones that, that uh, during the tribulation period, many will be saved. And, uh, and so uh, people that come to age of accountability, perhaps, uh, people that are born during that time, uh, I don't understand how God's working all that. I know this, the Bible says, if you've had opportunity and said no to Christ, you'll believe strong delusion. So uh, the God of all the earth will do right, but there is going to be many saved. Those, those 144,000 Jews will trust on Christ and, and become evangelists. So that's how the Bible says it's going to happen. And during that time, people are going to study the scriptures and whoso read it, let them understand. When they see this happen, they're going to realize, hey... This is halfway of the tribulation. Now the great tribulation starts. So how do you know that? Verse 16. Then let them which in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. And neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child. And to them give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day again. Uh, the Jews, we wouldn't worry about it was the Sabbath day. By the way, even the housetop thing. If you go to Israel, they have housetop. And you say, well, if I'm on the housetop, I gotta, for us, we think the second story maybe, I've got to go down through the house, but not them. Their stairs are on the outside, so don't even go in the house to get something. Get on immediately. Uh, verse 21, for then shall be great, here it is, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So this is not talking about the destruction of the temple in AD 70. This is talking about what Revelation is talking about. The end of the world, all right? The end of this age. And so this great tribulation now has begun. Verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. Now the word elect there is not talking about the church. It's not talking about those who have been saved this time that the Lord used that word elect as well. Uh, he's talking about Israel here. Why? Church is gone. Church isn't here, all right? And he says it's going to be shortened. Now, that's part of the reason, as you go to Matthew 25, that uh, parable in uh, verse 19, where he says, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh. It's been a long time. We're 2,000 years. But the time of the tribulation is going to be a short time. It's just seven years. It's going to be shortened in God's mercy, see. That's why I believe that one's towards the church. All right. Uh, verse 22 ends this area. What should be the sign of the end of the world? And so this is, like I mentioned, Daniel's 70th week. This is where the missing week from Daniel's prophecy is, fits in here, this tribulation period. I want you to turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, if you would. 2 Thessalonians 2. Uh, I can't bring everything out. can't go to every passage, but I want to look here just a minute. 
Uh, 2 Thessalonians helps you to see uh, the timing of things. There's people that want to say there's a post-trib rapture, some that say there is no rapture, some that say mid-trib rapture. Post-trib rapture never made sense to me because Jesus is coming down, so we're going up, and then we're coming back down, and he's setting up his millennial kingdom, so that doesn't make sense. But anyway, regardless, uh, that's we believe in pre-trib seven years prior. But notice chapter 2. Second uh, Thessalonians 2, to me, is the most convincing argument about it. Look at it. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. So he's talking about the end time. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you. Sounds like Jesus in Matthew 24, doesn't it? Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. This is that Antichrist uh, coming in and people worshiping him, the mark to be all this. And that man of sin, that's the Antichrist, be revealed. The son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. And by the way, the Antichrist is just the devil, all right? So that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so he's going to set up this image we just talked about, the abomination of desolation. I'm God, worship me. Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. It's talking about the devil's time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. God's talking about there a restrainer. There's something holding back the Antichrist, and that's the presence of the Holy Spirit of God on this earth. And the Holy Spirit of God is in believers. What? No, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. But when the rapture takes place, we are all taken out of this wor world, and so God's presence is removed at that time. So the Bible says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then, interesting, that same time word, verse 8, and then shall that wicked, capital, wicked be revealed, talking about Satan, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's Matthew 24, verses 20 to 7 to 30, that lightning of him coming, and he's going to come in judgment. All right, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, and so the Antichrist is controlled by Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Again, I mentioned the next one coming with power and wonders. We ought to be concerned about it in our day because the next one coming with signs and wonders and miracles is the Antichrist. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. What a sad thing, those that follow the Antichrist. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They, they wouldn't receive the truth, the love of the truth of God's word. Now they're going to believe a lie and follow the Antichrist, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so I believe, again, that rapture has to take place so that the Antichrist can move among this world and have the, the freedom to do it because the restrainer of the Holy Spirit is stopping him from doing that at this time. On the occasion, uh, in verse 22, as we finish out this, this section, we'll move to the last uh, section here. Verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, back in Matthew 24 now, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. If you remember, during the tribulation period, as you study the book of Revelation, just on one occasion, one-third of the world's population is gone. Well, you do the math, okay? One-third is gone. Uh, you've got eight billion now. Let's just say round, uh, round numbers. One-third's gone. What's one-third of eight? That's not an easy one, is it? Come on. What are we at? Yeah, about five-something. 5.8. What's left? I'm sorry, what's still alive? Two-thirds are alive. Five-point-something? What is it? Five-point what? Five-point three? Okay. Someone's got the calculator up by now. Then on another occasion after that, one-fourth of the population is knocked out. So what's one-fourth of that? What's left? You're down to about half, about four at that point. Is that right? Yeah. And so just in those two events, half of the population is knocked out. Let's just use real numbers. Let's say the population is 1,000. Third's gone. You've got 666 left. Okay. 
what's a, what's a, a, a quarter of that? You, you look at it, it's right at 500. I did the math this afternoon. And so you're right at half point right there, half. That's just two occasions. There's many other things, wars, things happening, people are being killed, this, that. And so the population of this world is going to be decimated. All right? That's why he's saying in verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. Okay? He's not talking about salvation going to heaven. He's talking about still alive. All right? And so one-fourth population destroyed, the population of the world is going to be really uh, down. Now, number three, lastly, the third question, that he, and it's the middle question now, but I begin to believe he starts answering in verse 23. Look at it. Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? Thirdly, lastly, what shall be the sign of thy coming? Uh, begin in verse 23. Then, notice that time word again. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. I believe what's happened at this point, the Antichrist is going to turn on the Jews. He signed the peace treaty. He's, he's helped them get the temple and work that out. Right now, they can't get the temple mount. Uh, the, the Muslims have a mosque there, the Dome of the Rock, a big gold dome there. That's Muslim, not Jewish. Yeah, but somehow he's going to work it out, and they're going to get the temple mount. They're going to build their temple, and, and this is going to take place. And, and so here it happens, and then he turns on them when he know, doesn't, doesn't need them any longer, and he is going to want everybody to turn the Jews in. It's going to be like, like another holocaust. And, and so here, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, he's here or there, believe it not. People are going to be saying to the Jews, hey, Christ is here. And they're going to get word and these false uh, whispers about it. Don't go out there. It's a trap. Keep reading. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. And so much if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I've told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, behold, he's in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers. Believe it not. And the emphasis on this part, again, is especially during the time of Antichrist. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, so here it is, the Lord coming now. When he comes out of the east and shines even to the west, so shall also some of the coming man be. It's not me secret. You don't have to go check if he's in the desert. He's not. When he comes and at the end of the seven-year tribulation, you will know it. It'll, everyone will know at that point. That's the end uh, of, uh, of, of the age, that be the battle of Armageddon when Jesus is about to set up his rule and reign. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. I don't have time to go into it. But that's the battle of Armageddon. That's when God is saying, come on, all you birds, come to this great supper of God. You'll eat the flesh of captains and horses. It's Revelation 19, uh, 17 to 19. You can read it later. But that's what that verse is referring to. There will be so much. The blood will run to the horse's bridle, the Bible says. Uh, all the people that are against the Lord will come uh, to J J Jerusalem. They're going to destroy Jer the Jews. But this time, Jerusalem won't be destroyed. Their king, their Messiah is going to show up. And he's going to defeat them with the word of his power. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the power of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the end of heaven to the other. This is not the rapture. Again, the elect here is referring to the Jews. He's already, the church of God's already been up there. The bride's already come to, uh, uh, to the bridegroom. But all the Israel is not in Jerusalem. Uh, they're not all in Israel. And so he's going to send his angels, the ministering angels, to the Jews, and they're going to bring them all in. And by the way, I notice we have a couple visitors tonight. If you're visiting tonight, I preached this morning in a more normal way, though yet long, but tonight's just more of a teaching. We're teaching on the prophecy, and that's what the text brings us. So a little different tonight, but just explaining some things rather than a normal message, just so you're aware. But I hope you'll come back again. I'm so glad you're here. Keep reading verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. And so, verse 34, And verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. I want you to look at something. This verse 34 is key, I believe. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. If you're thinking about the generation that Jesus is speaking to, you're thinking, well, they're all dead and gone. And so that, that's not, that, that isn't, must not be what he means. Uh, now, they did see the destruction 
of, of Israel and that in their generation uh, when, uh, in AD 70. But, um, but that doesn't make sense for this, all right? Well, if we're going to let the Bible uh, give the literal interpretation of generation means generation, for instance, Matthew 23, verse 36. Look at Matthew 23, 36. We, we talked about this. Same word. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. What things? The temple destruction. Israel, the house will be left desolate. And it did happen in that generation. All right? And so here he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. Well, what generation is he talking to? Well, back up to verse 31. I believe he's talking to the people that see this happen. The Son of Man come. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. To the other. That generation. Verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not, come to, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now I meant to start the message by saying, I just didn't put it in my notes. I'm not a prophecy preacher. I'm not someone that, you know, I, I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God, but I've not pastored for 35 years and preached all the prophetic books or anything like that, okay? Um, this is one of my first times preaching, actually, in, in something that's really prophetic like this. Uh, but just trying to help give understanding. I've not preached the book of Revelation yet, though I've been around that. Not personally done it. And so I'm enjoying this, but uh, at the same time, I'm not claiming to be some theological scholar or anything like that. Uh, but from my understanding as I'm reading and, and looking and studying through this, uh, just to help bring out what is the text talking about, if you remember, he, in, there was no state of Israel until 1948. And so in that time, the, uh, the, the Israel was was now a nation. So the generation that sees Israel become a nation, and that's what many good Bible scholars believe as well, will see this all come to pass. Not, again, there's no signs for the rapture. The rapture could happen any moment, any moment. But we'll see this happen where, where the things he's just talked about, that uh, the rebirth of the state of Israel, the budding of the fig tree, the beginning of the end of all these things, that generation won't pass till all is fulfilled. Now, Generation term is elastic a little bit. I'll just say this, because I, this is what, that's, that's what, kind of what I believe, that that generation. But there is people that believe when it says this generation, it's talking about the Jews in general. The Jews will not end. You can try to, Hitler tried to get rid of all the Jews, you can't do it. That type of thing, God's people are going to go on. And I'm not against that, I believe that too. But I, I think this passage is talking more about what I was just explaining. And so generation term, though, is elastic, meaning someone says 40 years. Well, it's been more than 40 years since 1948. Uh, someone says, well, it's 80 years a generation. Um, but as you study the Bible, you can see it, it, it is elastic, meaning it's not an exact. It can be the time that a generation can be the time that you take the load. Uh, not to be in any way offensive, but there's, there's young people. Here we'll go to both sides. There's young people here. They're not guiding this nation yet. They're not guiding uh, the workforce yet. Then there's people on the other end. There's people that are no longer, they've, they, they did carry the load and they've set it down and let a younger generation take the load of guiding the nation, guiding the workforce, all right, on both sides of that. So some people look at that time as your generation. And then others say it's your whole lifetime from birth to death, including the death of your contemporaries. So it could be 120 years even as long as that. Uh, I don't know. I don't think God wants us to know exactly. We'll keep reading. We'll see him say that. But I think that's interesting. I believe it is near and I believe many, many people are along that same line. As I preached this morning, if God wanted us to know every detail, he could have wrote it down exactly like that. But it's not there that way. In fact, he goes on to say, verse 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, and <laughs> know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the day, in that days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark. So I don't believe anyone will know the day, but I think some will, as they follow the scriptures and, and read, will have a good idea of the year. will have a good idea of the time. Why? Because they'll see these things happen that God's laid out. We haven't seen that yet. We're only verses 5 through 8, I believe. But they'll be able to see a lot of these things as it gets closer. But even then, they won't know the day or the hour. Verse 39, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
It's talking about the end of the tribulation period when he actually puts his foot down on this earth. Verse 40, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinded at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Uh, I, the word taken in verse 40 and verse 41, I drew an arrow back that took them all away. I believe these ones taken are not like we would think of the rapture, but it's actually the other way. These taken are taken in judgment. Those that were taken away during the flood weren't taken somewhere good. They, they died because they weren't on the ark. The ones that are left will be ushered into the millennial kingdom. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that the good man of the house had known what, what watch the thief would come. He would watch. He would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made rule over his household, to get, give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants, to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. In an hour that he's not aware. Notice that day and hour again. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. that shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, lots here. Obviously, this can be taken and breaking down and taken. But I, I'm not preaching the book of Revelation. Just this part here. But pretty powerful, the events taking place and, and uh, by the way, when I say usher in the millennial kingdom, that doesn't mean heaven. Uh, during the millennial kingdom, Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years. They'll have the privilege of hearing him speak, hearing him teach, I'm sure, gather around. And they can choose to believe on him, but at the end of the thousand year reign, the devil will be loosed for a little season. And many of the Bible says will follow him. But these will be going to the millennial kingdom. We're going to see that at the end of chapter 25 as well. We're going to conclude tonight... Uh, let me give you the order of events. Scholars of prophecy don't agree on all the future events. This is where I am. This is where this church stands on the order, all right? Number one is the rapture of the church. I'm going to give you seven of these events as we conclude. The rapture of the church. So where do you find that? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 18. Now this can occur at any time. So what's going to happen next in the calendar events? The rapture of the church. The twink of an eye, any moment. Trump could sound. Number two, next what will happen is on this earth, now we're not looking at heaven, just down here, the leader of the ten European nations make a seven-year agreement with Israel. Daniel 9. All right, you study 26, 27 specifically, but you see that as you study Revelation and, and study Daniel. Then, number three, after three and a half years, he breaks the agreement, Daniel 9, 27. And what the Lord Jesus just said, would happen in, in uh, Matthew 24 and verses uh, 15. Uh, then uh, he moves to Jerusalem, sets up his image in the temple. That's the abomination of desolation. desolation. The Antichrist begins to control the world, number five, and forces all people to worship and obey him. At this time, God sends the great tribulation upon the earth, verse 21 of Matthew 24 we just read. Then the nations gather at Armageddon to fight the Antichrist in Israel. Uh, but uh, come to fight Israel, but see the signs of Christ coming and unite to fight the Lord. And of course, Jesus is going to be victorious. That's the battle of Armageddon. And number seven, Jesus returns to the earth. Actually puts his foot down after the battle is over, Mount of Olives. He defeats his enemies, is received by the Jews, and is established, establishes his kingdom on earth. You see that Revelation 19, 11 and following. Zechariah 12, 7 to 13. Uh, chapters 13, verse 1. And he will reign on the earth for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verses 1 to 5. And so the purpose of prophecy and, and this thing that God gave in Matthew 24 is not to entertain the curious, all right? It's to encourage those that are saved. It's to encourage those that have consecrated themselves to God. Encourage you and I. Look, no one's going to know the day and hour, but we can be aware of the movements of events and not be caught by surprise. Matthew 25, we looked at this morning at large. It has those three parables I've talked about, each group there. But the last section, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, I'm not going to take the time because our time is gone. But when he talks about brethren here, and as you go through 31 to 46, you have three groups. You have Jews, gen, excuse me, you have sheep, goats, and you have brethren. And so the Lord's going to come. It's the judgment of the Gentile nations. It's different from the judgment seat of Christ and different from the great white throne judgment. This is going to be to see who will enter the millennial kingdom. 
This is after the battle of Armageddon's over. This is the remnants what's left. Remember, a quarter of the a third of the population was gone. A quarter of the population after was gone later. Other things happened, earthquakes, all these things. Then the battle of Armageddon, blood ran to the horse's bridle. So you say, how many people are left in the world? I don't know, but not a lot. It's gone way down from six, uh, you know, eight billion, whatever it is. Way down. So, I don't know, one billion? I have no idea. The Bible doesn't give any indication. But whatever is left, Jesus now, verse 31, Son of man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divide the sheep from the goats. And so he's going to do that. And it's going to be in the basis, not of their person, but the basis of their performance. What did they do to the Jews? As you, as you read through this passage, you'll see the brethren mentioned. And they said, they'll say, when did we, Lord, give you a cup of water? When did we uh, come to you when you were in prison? When did we? He says, as much as you did unto these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And so during the 144,000 Jewish evangelists going around the whole earth, the Antichrist is going to be going after them. Uh, you, you think uh, people that have, you know, the government doesn't like, now they go after someone. Uh, think about when the Antichrist has the power of the whole world. And they're gonna, it's going to be like a holocaust. And if, if they don't have the mark of the beast, you can't buy, you can't sell, you can't work. So people are going to be telling on them. We read that earlier in the passage, remember, back in uh, verses 9 and 10 of Matthew 24. People are going to be uh, delivering them up to be afflicted. They're going to kill them. They're going to be hated. Uh, many should be offended, should betray one another, hate one another. And so uh, it's going to be awful. If you give a cup of cold water with this, it could be at the risk of your life. But those that dare to help the Jewish people, those will be the, the way he judges who goes into the millennial kingdom. Not who goes to heaven. They go into the millennial kingdom will have opportunity then. Those that didn't, they'll already probably have taken the mark of the beast. They've said no to God and no to his people, and they'll be headed to hell. You say, how do you know that? Well, read the end, verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, the righteous will go to heaven, but, but uh, I believe here he's talking about those that go into the millennial kingdom. So you study it more. I would love to talk to you more about it. Our time is gone. But the Gentile nations are divided, sheep and goats, uh, right there. Let's, let's, let's conclude. I mentioned earlier it was a surprise to both groups. It's interesting, you read it, they're both, when did we see you, Jesus? Or when, when did we not help you, Jesus? As you didn't do it to the Jews here. You didn't do it to me. I don't want you to be caught by surprise when it comes the time to stand before the Lord. Uh, we went back to Matthew 7 earlier this morning. Do you know the Lord Jesus? Are you ready to see him? As we wait for the coming of our glorious king, we know for certain he's coming back. Today we're closer to his return than we were yesterday. When he comes, his return will exceed our expectations. We've been hopeful, anticipated this event. I want to tell you, you've had other experiences you've been waiting for, and it's like, eh, it was kind of a letdown. This will not be a letdown when Jesus comes. Heaven's going to be wonderful. And it will, be so, it will not be so with the second coming of Christ. You won't be disappointed. Our words are inadequate to describe the glory of what that scene will be like, the, us that are in heaven with him, as well as all that will unfold the days to come after that. After all this is over, the millennial kingdom, we go into the eternal state, and I'm going to quote C.S. Lewis, Chronicles of Narnia, any of you fans? C.S. Lewis is a great Christian writer. He gave us a rich, imaginative picture of the eternal state. This is how he ends the series of books. As Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after, but for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia can only, been, uh, can only be the beginning, the cover, the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on, on earth has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And that's the way heaven's going to be. Don't you like that? So for believers, the return of Christ, the end of this world, will be the beginning of a new heaven, new earth, Revelation 21, 22. And while waiting and watching confidently, 
for the Lord's return, Christians urgently work. And so let me challenge you, be ready, be ready for him. We fight deception and temptation. We persevere through tribulation. We endure persecution as we proclaim the gospel of the kingdom throughout the whole world. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And we do this in full dependence on God. He is going to come through for us. We spend our lives, even lose them, if necessary. We know Christ's power as we serve Him. And He'll ensure that our church, His church, will accomplish the purpose He has as we walk with Him. Watch. Be ready. Are you ready to meet the Lord today?